Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Outer Temple Chambers' first edition of Ask a Silk. The format of these sessions is a quick Q&A session with an eminent silk in chambers around a topic or recent case. Uh, and today I'm joined by Andrew Spink, you see, one of the heads of Outer Temple Chambers, uh, a former chair of Combar, uh, and a deputy high court judge, and also a judge in the Astana International Financial Centre. Today, we're going to be talking about the enforcement of foreign judgments at common law and the recent decision of Hague and GFH Capital, which concerned the enforcement of a DIFC judgment. Now, it's important to note that today we're going to be talking about enforcement at common law and not the regime that applies where there's a mutual recognition treaty between the UK and a foreign jurisdiction. Now, the most significant of those mutual recognition treaties is the Brussels regulation, which is going to apply until the Brexit transition period comes to an end. And thereafter, it's expected that the UK will become a signatory to the Lugano Convention, which has similar provisions and scope. Uh, there are also numerous mutual enforcement treaties, uh, principally with former Commonwealth countries. But many important jurisdictions are still subject to the common law rules. So with that introduction out of the way, uh, hi, Andrew. Uh, hi, my Sam. first question, my first question is, how does one go about enforcing a foreign judgment from a jurisdiction which isn't covered by one of those mutual recognition treaties? Well, at a, a relatively high level, a recognition of a foreign judgment at common law requires the claimant to bring an ordinary debt claim in the English courts, the debt being the sum payable pursuant to the foreign judgment. For such a judgment to be enforceable, it must meet three conditions. First of all, it must be a judgment for a definite sum of money. A judgment which specifies a calculation to obtain that definitive sum, for example, interest which accrues, is for a definite sum. Second, and crucially, it must be final and conclusive. This effectively means a final first instance judgment. The mere fact that an appeal is outstanding doesn't prevent a first instance judgment being final and conclusive for these purposes. Uh, thirdly, uh, the foreign court must have jurisdiction according to English rules of jurisdiction. A foreign court will have jurisdiction according to those rules if uh, the defendant was present in that jurisdiction, the ju the, if the defendant was a claimant or a counterclaimant in the foreign case, if the defendant entered an appearance other than to contest jurisdiction, or if the defendant has submitted to the foreign court. Now, if you meet those three, uh, those conditions, are there any defences that a judgment debtor could run? Yes, there are. First of all, a debtor could seek to argue that the first judgment was procured by fraud. Interestingly, there's no requirement uh, for the debtor to show new evidence going to fraud they can rely on the same evidence that was available at the time of the hearing in the foreign court, even if that evidence was actually put before that court and adjudicated upon. Secondly, if recognition would be contrary to public policy, that's English public policy, for example, there is some suggestion that a foreign judgment awarding manifestly excessive damages uh, is unenforceable here. Thirdly, if the proceedings in which judgment was obtained uh, were opposed to natural justice. Now, moving on to the Hague and GFH case in, in particular, why is that judgment of interest in this context? Well, there are two reasons, Simon. First of all, it's the first judgment enforcing a judgment of the Dubai International Financial Centre in England. The DIFC is an offshore financial centre in, in Dubai, which is subject to its own code of law akin to English law, and its own judicial system. Secondly, uh, the Hay case considered a number of arguments about the nature of the DIFC, which go to the enforceability of its judgments. Uh, what sort of arguments did Mr. Haig run to um, uh, avoid enforcement of the judgment? Well, uh, I think it's fair to say that Mr. Haig ran every conceivable argument that could have been run, um, but it's important for our purposes today to focus on just three. First of all, he argued that the DIFC courts did not have jurisdiction, uh, but according to domestic UAE law, 
uh, the local courts should have jurisdiction. Uh, the English court uh, made clear that domestic laws on jurisdiction were irrelevant, but it was the English jurisdiction principles I mentioned earlier which apply. Secondly, Mr Haig argued that the DIFC judgment was obtained by fraud. In that respect, uh, Mr Justice Henshaw, who gave the English judgment, uh, observed as follows. The DIFC court is a well-established and reputable foreign legal system with procedures and rules similar to the CPR. And Justice Sir Jeremy Cook, uh, who had given the judgment in the DIFC court against Mr Haig, is a former judge in charge of the commercial court in England and Wales. That clearly gave Mr Justice Henshaw the confidence to rely on the findings in relation to the allegations of fraud made by the DIFC court, which Mr Hay sought to raise again in the enforcement proceedings in England. Thirdly, Mr Hay sought to argue that the DIFC courts were not impartial. He relied on, amongst other things, uh, international reports which criticised the impartiality of the civil courts, the fact that the judges of the DIFC swore an oath of office to the ruler of Dubai, and the fact that DIFC judges were foreigners operating on short-term contracts. Mr Justice Henshaw rejected all three of these arguments. He first of all observed that the international reports related to the onshore courts uh, and not those of the DIFC itself. Uh, he also held that the mere fact that judges swore an oath to the ruler did not impair their ability to make rulings against ministers. Uh, and he finally held that the short-term nature of the appointment of a person such as Sir Jeremy Cook, uh, who had already had a full career as a High Court judge in England and Wales, uh, or the equivalent in another jurisdiction out, outside Dubai, which applies to a number of the judges of the DIFC court, and who then accepts an appointment to the DIFC as a follow-on career, uh, does not even arguably impair that person's independence such as to found a public policy ground for declining to enforce uh, his or her judgments. An argument that was left unaddressed because it didn't apply on the facts was what the position would be if the judge in question was one who had previously served in the onshore courts and or where the issues in the case would require criticism to be made of the UAE or its political leadership. So what, what does that mean in relation to the enforcement of DIFC judgments in England moving forward? Well, I think it's pretty safe to say that any public policy or natural justice challenges to enforcement will face real difficulty. Um, the uh, commercial court uh, also recognised in giving this judgment the general quality of the DIFC as a judicial dispute centre. So I think those issues are very difficult to raise again in a different case. Perhaps, uh, perhaps a more fruitful line of, uh, of attack to enforcement, against enforcement, would be if uh, the only basis of the DIFC's jurisdiction in a given case was the claimant's presence in the DIFC, which uh, unusually is sufficient for the DIFC to take jurisdiction, but which the English rules don't recognise as a basis for jurisdiction. And as I said earlier, it's what the English rules for jurisdiction are that matter in this particular case where one's looking at enforcement in England of a foreign judgment. Well, that's great. Th thanks very much for that, Andrew. Um, now on a lighter note, we're doing this on Zoom because we're all locked down. I know you're in the West Country and I'm up in South Manchester. Um, how's lockdown life been treating you? What are the, what, any personal positives from this time? Well, I think uh, on the per purely personal front, if it's not a cliche to say it, uh, more time with the family, um, not just because I'm at home much more than I usually am, but also my adult children have been uh, here too for a long time, having to put up with living with their parents. Um, also with rather incredible timing, um, a great positive for, for me and my family has been the uh, 11 Labrador Retriever cross puppies that were born two days before lockdown started. Um, they've provided us with a lot of fun and actually some members of Chambers with quite a bit of fun, albeit remotely in the case of the members of Chambers, of course. You know, I've, I've enjoyed the photos and videos, I think, like, like lots of us. And what have you missed? What have you missed the most? Well, genuinely, I'm not just saying this because I'm speaking to one of them. I've missed my colleagues. Um, we've 
interestingly, I think from lockdown, we've all learned how much we can actually undertake equally well away from chambers or, or out of court by working remotely. Um, and as a result, I, I personally haven't really missed going to court because my cases have been really well dealt with remotely. Um, and if anything, um, in many ways, it'd be more efficiently run than if we'd all gone to court. Mm -hmm. um, I think the same goes for conferences. Um, and also in my own case, as one of the heads of chambers, the huge number of chambers management meetings that I've had to attend during lockdown, uh, which are rather better done by Zoom than from, uh, and, and from home than face to face in chambers. But the one thing that for which there is no good substitute is uh, being able to see and talk to my fellow members of chambers face to face on a frequent basis. And I have really missed that. Well, thanks, Andrew. That's, um, I think we've, we've all missed that sort of social interaction uh, at the Definitely. workplace. So hopefully um, uh, this will end soon and we'll be back to normal. Um, thank you everyone for watching. We hope this has been interesting uh, and illuminating and um, uh, we hope to be able to see you soon in real life. Uh, thank you very much again. Thank you. Bye-bye.